Ooh, things, the breakthrough is very near. The Lord told me to remind this person he can change in a moment the struggles of decades. And our God is bringing suddenlies and he's bringing breakthroughs right now. How many received that in the Lord? Our God is bringing suddenlies and he's bringing breakthroughs right now. Yes. And I just want to encourage you in the Lord. The enemy is trying to whisper in people's ears, give up. But at the same time, the Holy Spirit is whispering in people's ears, it's time to go up. Do you hear that? Right now, the enemy is trying to whisper in people's ears, give up. But at the same time, Holy Spirit is whispering in the other ear, it's time to go up. And the Lord is going to take us from height to height and glory to glory. How many receive that in the Lord? Amen. Amen. As the lights are coming on this morning, let's just give this time to the Lord. And I'm just excited about the word that's about to be released. How many have just enjoyed the presence of the Lord? Amen. Amen. And I tell you what, people kind of came into the sanctuary today in stages and phases. And every time someone came into the sanctuary that hadn't gotten here yet, who came in for the first time this morning, I just felt the momentum in the Lord building in the room. It's really, really neat. Until we had kind of a final group come in for praise and worship, and then whew, the presence of the Lord just fell in the room. How do you know that that means many things? But one of the things that it means is everybody is important, and every part of the body matters. And the real move of God came when everybody got in the room. How many are catching that? That's so important. So I'm so glad that you're here this morning. I'm so glad, hallelujah, that our virtual family is here this morning. But most importantly, I'm excited the Lord is in this place right now. Amen. Amen. The Lord is in this place right now. God is healing relationships. God is healing hearts. God is positioning people. God is doing amazing things, isn't he? And we just give the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Amen. Hallelujah. hallelujah. So, Lord Jesus, right now, as this word goes forth throughout the earth, we decree and declare, Lord Jesus, that you are the living word. And man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from your precious mouth. Yeah. Lord Jesus, we ask during this time, may you speak the word to us. May you release the glory in this room. Holy Spirit, that wave of glory I felt at the end of praise and worship, may that wave of of glory pour out yeah. upon this house Lord and Lord upon the household of everybody that's listening into this word today Lord Jesus everything that you have for us we desire because we desire everything that you are Lord Jesus so Lord have your way in this place today Lord, I thank you that your words are life and health even unto our bones Lord I thank you this day that your word is alive and living. And Lord, as we've been flowing in the Holy Spirit in praise and worship, Holy Spirit, we ask now, may you bring the word and may you give us a word today that opens up our understanding. May you give us a word today that opens up the eyes of our hearts. May you give us a word today that brings breakthrough in this room. May you give us a word today that we're going to meditate on, that we're going to hey, give all hey, and go in the deep places of that revelation and lift it up and walk it out in you, Lord. So I speak a release of the hey of the Lord in this room right now. Hey, give all hey. Lord, may we meditate on your word as your word is released today. And Lord Jesus, I pray, may your word bring fresh life to our bones. May your word release healing in this room and in the lives of those listening in. May your word release power. Lord, I just heard you say someone's listening in today and you're releasing healing over their physical body. Lord, I just thank you for that right now and I just bless that, Lord. They're holding on to your word right now. They've been decreeing it and declaring it. And Lord, you're releasing your healing over them. And Lord, I just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. I want to encourage you, get your recorders ready, get your notebooks ready. Hallelujah. Get your prophetic journals ready because God is going to begin to speak to you in this word today. Hallelujah. How many received that in him? Amen. You know, it's interesting, the progression of the words that God's spoken in this house over the last year. And I think if we went back and we looked at every title, we would see a progression and a building in the Lord. First comes the knowledge, then comes the test. I think God has really been giving words to prepare us for what is coming. Amen? Yeah. We've talked about shifting Hallelujah. We talked about shifting in the Lord. We've talked about the glory of the Lord. We've talked about going deeper in the Lord. Today, we're going to talk about shifting the atmosphere. Amen. We're going to talk about shifting the atmosphere. And if we're going to walk in the glory of the Lord, we've got to understand this supernatural concept called the atmosphere. And today, God is going to give us a revelation knowledge in this area of atmosphere. We're going to look in two main passages today. One's in Deuteronomy and one's in Leviticus. And they both chronicle what God was doing in Israel as he brought them out of Egypt and into the promised land. So we're going to start in Deuteronomy chapter 6, if you have the word today. And there are many parallels between what God did in Israel as he led them up out of Egypt through the wilderness and into the promised land. There's many powerful prophetic parallels there that parallel what God's about to do in the church. What God is doing in the church right now. How many received that in the Lord? And so today, we're going to get some more prophetic parallels. A few, few weeks ago, the Lord allowed me to speak on the prophetic parallels of the high priest. Now we're going to look at prophetic parallels of Israel coming out of Egypt through into the promised land and into the promises that God had for them. How many know we're coming into the promises that God has made to us? How many know he's the promise maker and he's the curse breaker? How many received that in the Lord? Hallelujah. And the Lord wants us to understand that today. So let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 6 as we talk about shifting the atmosphere. Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we're going to start in verse 10. Verse 10 this morning. Now, this is important for us to understand. We are in a time where I believe God is moving us from the outpouring of the anointing to the outpouring of the glory. It's a shifting that's going on. Remember, when we are flowing in the anointing, God is releasing the anointing through us. And we are working in the flow of the anointing. So how do you know you go to Walmart, you see somebody, God highlights them supernaturally, gives a word to you for them, maybe it's a word of knowledge, and you go and release that word. That's the anointing of God flowing through you. Okay? But there's a difference between the anointing and the glory. You work in the anointing, you rest in the glory. Amen. How many receive that? The anointing flows through you, the glory comes in the room and manifests. And one aspect of the glory is atmosphere. Okay, we've got to understand that. One aspect of the glory is atmosphere. And it's very interesting that when we start talking about the atmosphere of God and relating that to the glory, we're specifically talking about the Shekinah glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. How many receive that? And this is interesting. How many know in the Hebrew there's two genders, male and female? There's no gender neutral in the Hebrew. That's a message in itself. Hallelujah. But we need to understand this. There's two types of glory. There's the Shekinah and there's the Kavod. And the Shekinah is when the atmosphere of the glory of the Lord comes in the room. And all of a sudden, the sick get healed. The lame begin to walk. The demonized are delivered. Powerful things are happening with no one in the room laying a hand on anybody. But when the kavod glory of God comes in the room, it's like the weighty presence of God presses down on the room and everybody goes down underneath the weight of the presence of the Lord. Here's something fascinating. In the Hebrew, the kavod 
as we look at the language God is using when he speaks the word kavod, it's in Hebrew masculine. The Shekinah is in the Hebrew feminine. Isn't that interesting? And many times the Shekinah comes in the room first and then the glory begins to fall. The Shekinah is more of the atmosphere of the glory that sets up the weighty presence and glory of God to come in the room. Which means what? If we want to see the kavod, we've got to understand the Shekinah glory of the Lord. How many are receiving that in, in the Lord this morning? Okay, if you've got the word this morning, let's stand up. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 10. How many know that we are coming into the promised land amen. in the Lord? Okay, I got one amen and then a half an amen. How many know we're coming into the promised land of the Lord? Yes. We are in the Hebrew year 5783. There's a lot of R's that are associated with this word in the realm of the Spirit. The Lord says it's a year of recompense. It's a year of renewal. It's a year of restoration. The Lord says it's the year of rebuilding. It's the year of renewing. How many receive that in the Lord? Yes. And it's the year where God's going to restore back to you what the enemy has stolen in what the locusts and cankerworm have eaten. And this year, I want you to keep this in front of you. This is your year of restoration. Amen. I want you to speak that into the atmosphere. Somebody say, this is my year of restoration. And I really believe this morning, the Lord is speaking to His people. Deuteronomy 6, verses 10. Hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord to 19. The Lord is speaking this as the children of Israel come into the promised land and he's saying this. When the Lord your God, now the word Lord in Hebrew would be Adonai. So he says here, when Adonai your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How many know that Paul said we're grafted into the vine? Yes. We're the seed of Abraham. So every promise that was made to Abraham is ours. How many received that in the Lord? Amen. He says, when I bring you into the land that I swore to your fathers to give you, a land with large flourishing cities you did not build. Houses with all kinds of goods you did not provide. Wells that you did not dig and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Then when you eat and you're satisfied... Be careful that you don't forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery. Yeah. Please be seated. That's a prophetic word from the Lord for the church in this hour. The Lord said, we're about to go into cities that we didn't build. We're about to receive houses that we didn't pay for, stocked with things that we didn't work for. God says he's about to pour out the wealth of the wicked on the righteous. Amen. How many receive that in the Lord? That's a promise for this year. He didn't say if you go into the land. He said when you go into the land. And I declare over us in the name of Jesus, we're going into the land. It's time, the Lord is saying. Hallelujah. we got to start stop talking in terms of ifs and buts when it comes to the Lord. He's not the God of ifs and buts. He's the God of the impossible. Yes. And he says, I want you to stop saying if this happens. The Lord says, if, I'm, if I've spoken it, I want you to stand in faith and say when this happens. Yes. But I want you to notice something that's very important in the Lord. The Lord said to Israel, you're going to come into the land that I have promised you, but I have a warning for you. And I want you to notice verse 13. He says, as all these things begin to happen, fear the Lord your God and serve Him only and take your oaths in His name. Verse 14, don't follow other gods, the gods of people around you. Verse 15, for the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God and His anger will burn against you and He will destroy you from the face of the land. The Lord says, when you come into all these things that I've promised you, the Lord says, I want you to keep one thing in mind. 
don't forget about me. The Lord says we're about to come in some mighty things that he's blessed. As the glory comes, as revival falls, don't forget to give him the glory and don't stop seeking his face yes. with hunger and thirst. Yes. Yes. That's what the Lord said to Israel. You're going to get in the promised land. You're going to be so blessed. Your tendency in the natural is going to be to forget about me. Don't do it. Because the Lord says, I want you to remember that I'm the same jealous God that gave the commandments to Moses on the mountain. I'm the same jealous God that put Adam and Eve in the garden and I wanted them all to myself. I'm the same jealous God that said to Israel, I remember the days of your youth when you were devoted to me like a young bride. How many know that our God is a jealous God? Yes. And there are some things that are about to happen and the Lord says, as I bless you, if you forget my goodness brought you there, I'm going to have to deal with you in the process. Well, Pastor, what does that have to do with atmosphere and the glory? Oh, this is going to become very apparent in just a moment. Why? Because the Lord says, I, the Lord your God, am jealous. How many know that the creator of the universe has no problem telling us he's jealous for our affection? And he's not jealous for some of our affection. He's jealous for all of our affection. How many received this in the Lord? Now that word that we see in verse 15, jealous, is the Hebrew word kunah. Q-I-N-A-H. It's the Hebrew word kunah. And if we really want to understand the jealous heart of God, we've got to understand what that word means in Hebrew. It means this. It means zeal. It means jealousy. It means to be passionate. And it means to be arduous. Now that word arduous, we don't really use that word anymore, but it means something that takes strenuous effort. So this is interesting. When the Lord said he's jealous for us, he says, I'm zealous for you. I'm jealous for you. I'm passionate about you. And I make a strenuous effort to pour out my agape love over you so that you'll become everything that I created you to be. See, that word jealousy, we look at it one dimensionally and we think of it in earthly terms. But how many know when God says he's jealous over us, it's a beautiful thing. I'm passionate for you. I'm zealous for you. I press in to you. David put it this way. You stoop down to make me great. That's how awesome our God is. Somebody say our God is awesome. Why is he jealous for us? Because he's a holy God. And guys, the Lord is saying to the church right now, I want to take you into a deeper walk of holiness. He's saying, I want to bring you into a deeper walk of holiness. What is that word holiness? In the Hebrew, it's the word kadosh. K-O-D-E-S-H. You can also pronounce it kodesh. And it means to be set apart for a specific purpose. The Lord says, I'm jealous for you because you're my set apart people. Yes. <laughs> is anybody catching that? He says to you, hallelujah, I am kuna for you because you are my Kodesh. You are a set-apart people for a set-apart God for a set-apart time and the people who know their God will do mighty exploits. The Lord was speaking to me the other day and he said, Andrew, 2022 was an ending. 2023 is a beginning in the realm of the Spirit. He said, 2022 is an ending 2023 is the beginning, but I a new beginning in the Lord. Isaiah 43, 18 to 19. Forget about the former things. Let go of the past. For behold, I'm doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? I'm making streams in the desert, rivers in the wasteland. How many received that in the Lord? But the Lord says for many of us, 2023 hasn't started out the way that we thought it would. We thought it was going to start off with God blowing the proverbial door off the hinges. And I feel that way. I mean, we're stepping into 2023. The ball comes down in New York and boom! God just blows things up. The Lord is blowing things up and he's doing it behind the scenes in a lot of ways that we don't see. He says, I'm setting things up and I will blow things up in my timing. Right now, what's happening in the lives of a lot of God's people is because he's wanting us to walk in a deeper walk of holiness, he's turned up the refiner's fire starting at the beginning of 2023. 
He is the great refiner, and he's, he is bringing the fire up. Why? Because there's a lot of things he's about to bless you with that he doesn't want you to come into carrying some things you're currently carrying. So the Lord says, I am burning off the dross of my people right now because I want them to walk holy. Some of you have heard me say this before. I was in prayer one time and I heard the Lord say, Andrew, I want you to be holy. And I had just studied holiness. And I said, Lord, I get it. That means to be set apart. And then there was silence. And then almost childlike, I caught myself thinking, well, Lord, you want me to be holy, but you're holy too. What does that mean? And the Lord said, Andrew, that means... I'm set apart for you. See, it's like the husband and wife relationship. How many know for a relationship to be successful, a marriage, it has to be exclusive. Yes. They can't see other people. Others can't be brought into the intimate circle. And what's the Lord saying to us? This is the year where I want to set you free from your other lovers. This is the year that I want to set you free from the things that have been holding you back from walking in a deeper level of intimacy with me, in a deeper level of holiness, and in the deeper calling that I'm calling you to at the end of the age. Does anybody care to receive that in the Lord? The Lord says, we're going to go deeper. We're going to go deeper. We're going to go deeper in 2023. And we're going to know him like never before. But the Lord says, don't forget about me. And the Lord says, don't test me. Let me say that again. He says, don't forget about me. And he says, don't test me. Notice verse 16. He says, don't test the Lord your God as you did at Massa. You know, as God was speaking to me, the, the, speaking this to me, and, and the Lord says, Massa there. I thought, you know what? I remember the children of Israel coming out of the wilderness. And, and I remember the situation at Massa. How they know in Massa... They had just seen God do a mighty miracle and all of a sudden they, they come to this area and there's no water. So what do they do? They begin to grumble and they begin to complain. Now the Lord was speaking to me and the Lord said this, 2023 hasn't started out the way that a lot of people had thought it would start out and a lot of people in the church, a lot of people in it with the Lord. But the Lord says this, don't think that I'm slow in keeping my promises and while you're waiting for me to do Bring about the recompense, the restoration, the renewal, the redemption in your life, the rebuilding and restoring in your life. Hallelujah! The redeeming in your life. The Lord says, don't find yourself at Massa. The Lord says, while you're waiting, don't begin to complain about what I'm doing. Why? It's very interesting. The Lord says, you tested me there. When we look at the Old Testament, God only tells Israel to test them one time, and that's in Malachi chapter 3, when he said, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, test me in this. Other than that, what does he say? Don't put the Lord your God to the test. How many are hearing this? Now this is interesting when we look at this. The Lord says at Massa, you did something. If you really study what happened there, uh, if we went further back in the word, we would see at Massa, they grumbled against the Lord and they grumbled against Moses. You know what they said? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt for us to die here in the wilderness? For us to die of hunger and for us to die of thirst. And the word says they grumbled against the Lord. Now that's interesting because in Hebrew, two words are used for grumble. One of them is the word lun, L-U-N. And you know what it means? It means to growl like a lion. Arr. So what did they do? They get to mass and there's no water. And what did they do towards the Lord and Moses? Arr. Now if that's not bad enough, the second word in Hebrew for grumbling is ragan, R-A-G-A-N. And you know what that stands for? Whispered rebellion. Whispered rebellion. And what does the word say rebellion is? Rebellion is as the sin of? So when they got to Massa and they started complaining, they either lund or ragand. I'm going to hope they lunged. I'm going to hope they growled that they didn't whisper rebellion. 
Because if they whispered rebellion, they got into witchcraft at Massa. How many received that? And the Lord says, while you are waiting for me to fulfill my promises this year, because I've made my mighty promises this year, don't grumble. The Lord says, don't growl at me and don't whisper things against me. Because that's going to open up the door for the enemy to come in and try to steal what God has for you. The Lord says, this is the year where I want to put a bit in your mouth. The Lord says, this is the year that I want to put a bit in your mouth. And I want your mouth to be controlled by me. Because God is going to release so many mighty things in the realm of the Spirit. He wants our mouths to participate in what He's saying. To decree and declare what He's saying. And He wants our mouths not to grumble or mumble or complain against Him. And give the enemy ground to work. How many are hearing what the Lord is saying? Now I want you to notice something. Let's go to Leviticus 14. And this word is going to make sense here in just a moment. Leviticus 14. Remember the Lord says in Deuteronomy 6, I'm going to bring you into cities you did not build, and I'm going to give you houses that you did not stock. That's what the Lord says, right? But it's very interesting if we look at Leviticus 14, starting in verse 34, God says something about those houses. And he says this. He says, when you enter the land of Canaan, which I'm giving you as your possession, guys, we're coming into the land. We're coming in the land that God has promised us. He says here, Israel, it's your possession, but how many know the earth and everything in it is of the Lord, is the Lord's? Amen? He says, I'm giving you as your possession this land. He says, and if I put a spreading mildew in a house in that land, the owner of the house must go and tell the priest, I've seen something that looks like mildew in my house. Isn't that an odd passage? Let me ask you a question. According to the word here in Leviticus 14, who puts the mildew in the house? The Lord. He said, if I put mildew in a house... Isn't that what he says here? We've got to look at the word of the Lord. This is, this is very important. He says, the owner of the house must then go and tell the priest, I've seen something that looks like mildew in my house. The priest is to order the house to be emptied before he goes in to examine the mildew so that nothing in the house will be pronounced unclean. After this, the priest is to go in and inspect the house. He's to examine the mildew on the walls, and if it has greenish or reddish depressions, that appear to be deeper than the surface of the wall, the, sur the, the priest shall go out of the doorway of the house and close it up for seven days. Seven means what in the Hebrew? The number of completion. On the seventh day, the priest will return to inspect the house. If the mildew is spread on the walls, he's to order that the contaminated stones be torn out and thrown into an unclean, unclean place outside of town. How many know Jesus was crucified outside of the city? Yes. He must have all the walls of the house scraped. Mm. And the material that is scraped, the scraped off, dumped into an unclean place outside of town. Then they are to take other stones and replace and take new clay and plaster the house. If the mildew reappears in the house after the stones have been torn out and the house is scraped and plastered, the priest is to go in and examine it. If the mildew is spread in the house, it's a destructive mildew and the house is unclean. It must be torn down, its stones, its timbers, and all the plaster, and taken out of town to an unclean place. And anyone who goes into the house while it is closed up will be unclean till evening, and anyone who sleeps or eats in the house must wash his clothes. But if the priest comes in to examine, and the mildew is not spread after the house has been plastered, he will pronounce the house clean, because the mildew is gone. Now let me ask you a question. How many have read this passage before? How many have thought, that's kind of an odd thing, mildew in a house, and why is God getting this practical? I want you to understand something. This passage is about more than mildew in a house. This passage is about atmosphere. This passage is about atmosphere. 
So Deuteronomy 6, I'm going to bring you into cities you didn't build. I'm going to give you houses that you didn't stock. I'm going to give you vineyards that you haven't tended. But the Lord says when you go into the promised land, if you take over a house and mildew is found in this house, the Lord is really saying it's a natural sign of something supernatural that's going on in that house. And you need to bring the priest in and he needs to take a look at this house. Now to understand that further, we need to understand this. The children of Israel get to the edge of the promised land. And there by the Jordan River. And the Lord says something fascinating to Joshua. The, the river is at flood stage. It wasn't going to be easy for Joshua. He's taken over for Moses. The Lord says, I want you to have the priest take the Ark of the Covenant and take it through the Sword and Jordan River. Isn't that interesting? Take it through the swollen, flood-ridden Jordan River. And the Lord says something interesting. He said, I'm about to take you by a way you've never been before. You know, the Lord has a word for you this morning. I'm about to take you somewhere where you've never been before. And you know what happens? The moment the priests carry the ark and step into the water, the water parts just like it did at the Red Sea. How many of you are hearing that? The Lord said, I'm going to part waters in your life this year that have never been parted before. But the interesting thing for Israel is they're going from giants to swollen rivers to mighty walled cities to all kinds of things in the land. You know what the Lord is saying for us? This year is not going to be easy, but it's going to be blessed. Come on. The Lord said, this year is not going to be easy, but my hand is going to be upon you this year like never before. Don't grumble and don't complain. Trust me. How many are hearing this in the Lord? Okay. Now this is something we need to understand is they were going into the promised land. There were going to be 10 major cities that they were going to have to bring down. The very first one was a city called Jericho. Everybody knows what the word says about Jericho, but this is what we need to understand. Why Jericho first? Why Jericho first? Well, geographically, that was the first city that they needed to come to. It's so much more than that. We've got to realize that this city of Jericho, this mighty walled city, in the Hebrew, Jericho means fragrant like the fragrance coming off a rose. But it's interesting if we look at Jericho in the Canaanite language, in the native language of that land at the time, it means moon. It means moon. Jericho was the center of moon worship in the promised land. It was the most occultic city in the entire land and it was the city where they worshipped the moon God. Yeah. What did God say to Israel as they're coming into the promised land? I'm going to give you cities that you didn't build. I'm going to give you houses that you haven't paid for stocked. Isn't that what he said? Uh-huh. Isn't it interesting? They're coming into the promised land in the very first city that they're going to take down is Jericho. And Jericho is a center of of idol, uh, idol worship, worship basically of the moon is what it is. The Lord says to Israel, when I give you those houses you didn't build, don't forget me and worship the gods of the land. The Lord's going to take the city out first. That's the center of idolatrous worship in the promised land. How many know he's making a statement? Yes. Now this is what we also have to understand about this. When we take a look at what was going on at the time, Rahab says something fascinating to the spies as they come into the city. She says, the people of this city are terrified of you because they know what Jehovah has promised you. How do you know right now the enemy is terrified of what God has promised us? Because we're about to take the land. So you know what the people did in response to that? Let me tell you what they did. As the children of Israel are walking around the city, as the children of Israel are planning to move forth and take that city, do you know what the people of Jericho said? They said this, they may get our houses and our vineyards, but they're not going to get our silver and our gold. So you know what they did in Jericho while the children of Israel were walking around the city those six days? They took their silver and their gold and they melted it down 
and they cast it in the image of demon gods that they worship throughout the land. They said, Israel's not going to get our silver and our gold, and they get everything else, but they're not going to get it. Then you know what they did with those little figures that they worshipped? They put them in the walls of the houses. They dug holes down in the ground in the house, and they buried those gold and silver demons in the ground inside the house. What do you think might cause God to put mildew in a house? <laughs> Is anybody starting to go, oh, that's interesting. So they were hiding them. And you know what the Lord said? If there's a house and there's mildew on the walls, I want that house inspected. I want it clean. If the mildew won't go away, I want it tore down. Why did God say that? Because I don't want there to be anything that's going to keep you from prospering as you go into the land. And the Lord says, as we go into the land, I don't want there to be anything that's going to hinder you. That's why right now I'm bringing the fire. That's why right now I'm refining. That's why I'm dealing with things around you. That's why, for some of us, that's why he's purging relationships from our life right now. Because there's things in those relationships that will hinder us from prospering. And right now, be careful because some of us are blaming the enemy for things right now that God's doing. And we need to be really, really careful with that and really discern what's going on. The Lord said, when you go in the promised land, if there's mildew in a house, it's a natural manifestation of a supernatural problem. There's something hidden in that house that I want to expose. Because how many know the children of Israel living in a house that had silver and gold demon gods hidden in the foundation and in the walls? How many know that was going to affect the atmosphere? You have to be very careful if you buy an existing home. Because if the people living in that home prior to you worshipped other gods, there's things that they may do, including putting things in the walls even today. And we've had people in this church before that have bought existing homes. We've gone through to pray over that home. And the Lord said there's something that needs to be dealt with that's in that wall. And we've opened it up and there's been coins from other countries in that wall or statues or all kinds of other things. I can't make this stuff up. How many know even when you build a new home on a property, you've got to pray through that property because you don't know what's going on in that property before you purchase it. And you've got to pray through that property, plead the blood, anoint it with oil because you don't know what's happened. Now the Lord is saying, I'm going to pour my glory out on the church. I'm going to pour my glory out on the house. That's why judgment begins with the house of God. Can anybody hear this? That's why judgment begins with the house of God. God is putting the fire on his house at the beginning of this year because the Lord wants to burn out of his house the things that are being worshipped that are not him. And, and people in churches right now are worshipping programs, pastors, denominations, systems. How many know that the bride of Christ was never intended to be a part of a system she was to belong exclusively to the bridegroom. Amen. See, we've got to understand this in the Lord, and the Lord is jealous for his people to come out from the Babylonian system that's in the church. So I want to take a few moments, and I want to talk about atmosphere. The Lord says the glory is going to fall in this house, that the, this house is going to be a glory center. We need to understand, how many know this house has been used for other things before we ever got here? See, the Lord wants to teach us about atmosphere. And what he's going to teach us this morning about atmosphere applies not only to the house that is the church, it applies to the house that you live in also. It applies to the place where you work. It applies to any place, basically, that you're going to go. Four things that God wants us to understand about atmosphere. Number one is this, and this is so important. God understands that atmospheres affect us greatly. See, God understands the atmosphere affects us. 
He said, you go to the promised land, you take over a home that you didn't build or pay for, and I put mildew on the walls. I'm letting you know there's something in the house that's going to keep you from being prospered. It's going to affect you, so I'm going to reveal to you it's there, and I want to deal with it. By the way, he's not only dealing with the what's in the house, he's dealing with what's in the house also. That is us. How many receive that in the Lord? Now this is interesting. If we study the word atmosphere, it comes from the Greek word spheria. S-P-H-E-R-I-A. It comes from the Greek word spheria. And are you ready for this? Spheria in the Greek means this. The envelope that surrounds something. The envelope that surrounds something or the mood of a person or a place. The envelope that surrounds something or the mood interesting. See, number one, the Lord says he wants us to know atmosphere affects us. Therefore, atmosphere is very, very important. God understands this. Atmosphere can affect your well-being positively or negatively. Atmosphere can affect how you sleep at night and even how you digest food. Atmosphere can affect relationships, marriage, kids, family, friendship. Atmosphere can shift words and twist them so you run into a situation where what I said was not what you heard. Atmosphere can cause an anointed message to fall 10 feet from the pulpit and go nowhere. An atmosphere can hinder your prayers. How do you know atmosphere is important? The atmosphere in this building, the atmosphere in your home, and the atmosphere around you and in you is very, very important. Now, I've been studying revivals that have gone on in our nation in preparation for what God's about to do. And the amazing thing that I've learned is this, or one of the amazing things. Pastors have heard during revivals that people in their church have, have been saying things and will come up to them after the revival begins to take place and will say things like, Pastor, I don't understand this. We're here in the atmosphere of revival in the building and the glory's falling and we're getting things right with our spouses and our kids and there's such an anointing and a oneness and a unity and then pastor it seems like we no soon get into our driveway at home and all of it evaporates and we're at each other's throats and it happens every week. How many know there's, that's an issue with atmosphere? Because if that glory can get sucked out of you the moment you walk in your home or apartments or condo, that means there's something wrong. Wait a minute, what if I live in an apartment building and there's all these people all around me? What if I live in a condo and there's people on both sides? Your place, your dwelling place can be... create an atmosphere that honors the Lord. See, right now, if you walked into the hall house, you would find that our radio is playing Christian music in the kitchen loudly. Are you hearing this? Yeah. Right now, what's playing in your home or not playing? If you've got an apartment, what's playing in the apartments all around you right now? That's affecting the atmosphere in yours. That's why if you've got an apartment or a condo or there's people really close to you or there's dark things going on in your neighborhood, don't leave the house without putting praise and worship music on. And keep it playing. Keep it playing. Why? Because that helps create an atmosphere. And isn't it interesting? The Lord said to the children of Israel, He said, if you go into an area and you take over a house and the mildew can't be destroyed, I want you to destroy that house. You know why? The Lord didn't want anything to get in the way of what he had for Israel. And God is jealous for you right now to walk in everything that he has for you. So right now he might be doing some things to remove things from your life so that you can begin to walk in the atmosphere that he really wants you to walk in. 
Is anybody hearing what the Lord is saying right now? How many know even Jesus understood the power of atmosphere? Well, what do you mean by that, Pastor? How many know when he went to the temple and the temple was filled with the money changers and the animals and all these things, he made a crude whip and he went in there and he started whipping people and turning over the tables and letting the doves loose. And he said, my father's house will be a house of prayer for the nations. You've turned it into a den of thieves. And what did Jesus do when he came in with the whip and threw everybody out? He was changing the atmosphere. See, people are supposed to bring their sacrifice with them to the temple. But what man did was he set up a marketplace so you didn't have to go through that unnecessary step that God said you had to. You can just come and buy your doves right there at the temple. And isn't it interesting? In the word, the dove represents the Holy Spirit. And the Lord kicked those out of the temple in the courtyard that were selling doves. What's about to happen in the church? The Lord's about to deal with people that are trying to sell the Holy Spirit. That are trying to market the anointing. God is about to deal with them in some very powerful ways. You just watch and see. Don't rebuke the devil because God's about to be behind a lot, behind a lot of things that are about to happen. How many are hearing this in the Lord? Amen. What was Jesus not going to do? Tolerate the atmosphere of the temple. I want you to notice something else that's interesting about the Lord's ministry and atmosphere. Let's go to Luke chapter 8 and verse 49. Luke chapter 8 and verse 49. How important is atmosphere? Let me tell you how important it is. We're going to go to Luke chapter 8 and verse 49 and the word of God says this. While Jesus was still speaking... Someone came from the house of Jairus. Now Jairus' name means God enlightens. He was the synagogue ruler. And they said, your daughter is dead. And he said, don't bother the teacher anymore. See, Jairus sends some people to go get Jesus because his daughter is very sick. While this is happening... The word is given them that the daughter's dead. Don't bother Jesus anymore. Notice verse 50. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. Let me ask you a question. Doesn't the word, didn't the word just say the daughter's dead? And what did Jesus say? Don't worry, she's going to be healed. Now, in the natural, don't we go, she's already dead? But how many know in the supernatural, we know that death has no authority when Jesus is around? Amen. Come on. And it says, don't worry, she's going to be healed. She's going to be raphod. Yeah. Come on. Hallelujah. What did Jesus say? I'm the resurrection and I'm the life. Death has no authority on my watch. Yeah. They looked at death as permanent. Jesus looked at death as an inconvenience. I'm going to heal it. We're going to shift the atmosphere. Now, I want you to notice what happens in this time of Jesus' ministry. When he arrived at the house, when he arrived at the house of Jairus, he didn't let anyone go with him, in with him, except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Do you know in Israel they had professional mourners? So somebody dies and you can pay people to come and mourn. So Jesus shows up and there's all these family members and paid mourners. Let me ask you a question. If you're getting paid to mourn, do you want to see the source of your income raised from the dead? There were conflicting interests at the house. So Jesus shows up and there's all these people wailing and mourning. It was an atmosphere of death and an atmosphere of grief and mourning. Now I want you to notice what Jesus did here because it's important. What did the Lord say? Stop wailing, Jesus said. He told them to stop their mourning. And I want you to notice what Jesus said. She is not dead, but she's asleep. Notice their reaction. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. 
Do you know there was also an atmosphere of unbelief around that house? And what did Jesus say? Stop! Why? Because Jesus knew what they were saying affected the atmosphere. The worst even said even Jesus went into his hometown and he faced such unbelief because they kept saying, isn't this the carpenter's son? That he did very few miracles there. That's why when we're in a service and the Lord says, I'm going to release my healing anointing, we need to respond with belief in our spirit. Yes. Because if unbelief could even hinder Jesus in his earthly ministry, that's a powerful atmosphere that we cannot tolerate. So I want you to notice what the word says. They laughed at him knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. And her spirit returned. And at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished. But he ordered them not to tell anyone what happened. Isn't it interesting? God said the two things needed to stop. And they both had to do with mouths. The Lord says, stop wailing in what you're saying. And then the Lord says, after the miracle, don't tell anyone. You know what that tells me? We need to make sure our mouths are really submitted to the Holy Spirit. Because things are about to happen. And there's some of the things that are about to happen are going to be things we've never seen before. We don't want to speak against something that the Holy Spirit is doing. We want to speak in agreement with what the Holy Spirit's doing. And how many know the Holy Spirit will never do anything that's not in alignment with the Word of God? So we've got to understand that this is the plumb line. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. This is the plumb line. See, we've got to understand that even Jesus understood the power of atmosphere. He had to cleanse the house first. Then who does he bring with him? Peter, James, and John. He, he brings in his three most intimate disciples with him. How do they know when they walked in the house, the atmosphere began to shift? See, the Lord wants you to be so full of His presence that you're an atmosphere shifter. That wherever you go, the atmosphere doesn't shift you. You shift the atmosphere. See, atmosphere affects us. That's why God wants you to be an atmosphere shifter. Have you ever walked into a place before and gone, Ooh, ooh, what is that? You're sensing the atmosphere. Nobody's even said a word. You're just sensing the atmosphere. The Lord says, I want to fill you so much with my glory anointing that you're going to walk into a place and I'm going to shift the atmosphere through you. You are going to be modern day arcs carrying my presence. See, as we get this, we won't be shifted again. We'll do the shifting. Um, does anybody receive that in the Lord? Okay. So number one, the Lord wants us to understand that he understands that atmospheres affect us. They affect worship. They affect prayer. They affect praise. Do you know during Brownsville, when that revival hit, they said during the duration of that revival, 4.5 million people came through Brownsville. 4.5 million people from around the world showed up. Let me ask you a question. Do you think when people from all around the world start invading church, the church service because the glory of God comes, that it affects the atmosphere? Sure it does. So you know what they did before every service? They went through the building from the back to the front and they cleansed that building before every single service. And they said then during the service, they never knew when the glory was going to fall. The glory can fall during announcements. The glory can fall during praise and worship. The glory can fall when the word was being preached. The glory would fall, could fall during body ministry time. Pastor Kirkpatrick said he'd come down off the altar and he'd have to plant his foot solidly on the ground because if he didn't, the glory that would flow down the aisles like a river would move him. When he came down off the altar, the glory of God was that strong, like a river going through that building. But you know what they had to do? Before the next service, they had to pray through the building again. That's why we started doing that before our services. Very, very important. We didn't do it this morning because we did it last night um, before we left. It's very, very important. Here's the thing. What we don't want to do as a church 
is work hard to have an atmosphere of the glory in the house. What do I mean by working hard? Doing things the way God wants us to. Watching what we say. Making sure we're a loving church. Fasting and praying and seeking God. Reading the word in the house. Preparing the atmosphere. What we don't want to do is fall into the trap of when the atmosphere is prepared, then we want to protect the atmosphere from people. Because that grieves the spirit of God. We're not a cruise ship, we're a lifeboat. And when we're going through the waters, we don't look at people in the water, pull them up by the head and go, no, you look too dirty. Spook. Uh, yep, you look like you might fit in the boat. Uh, yep, you can come in. See, you don't try to protect the atmosphere from people. The atmosphere is here because the Lord said, and I will be your God and you will be my people and I will dwell amongst you. What we learn how to do is to perpetuate the atmosphere no matter who God brings in. Amen. The moment we want to protect the atmosphere from people, revival's over. Yes. And that's how many revivals have ended. They wanted to protect what God was doing from people. Revival's all about people. Amen. Come on! Amen. It's all about people! Amen. Don't you think when Jesus stepped foot on the, the lake, the shore of the Gennesaret, and all of a sudden the enemy's biggest weapon and the Gadarene shows up and it's legion, and legion starts manifesting. Don't you think the disciples went, whoa, Lord, you're not going to let him in the boat, are you? As they're stepping back. And you know what Jesus did? He stepped forward. Come on. Amen. Hallelujah. That's why we've got to be a body that receives anyone the Lord wants to bring around the foyer. We're a refuge. Amen. And God wants to teach us the refuge mentality. And the refuge mentality isn't trying to protect the house from people. It's opening up the house so people can come in. Yeah. Are we going to have to cleanse the atmosphere? Sure. <laughs> but you know what? Without the Lord and without people, there's no church. Amen. Come on. We're a lifeboat. Amen. We're a lifeboat. We're learning how to be a lifeboat. And sometimes I think people come in and we're like, oh, we got to protect. No, the Lord brought them. Well, what if the enemy brought them? Then the Lord's going to get them. <laughs> Hallelujah. We want to be a refuge. It's a city of refuge concept. They just waited at the walls for people to come and open up the doors because people were fleeing from all kinds of things. How many are hearing this? Here's the second thing the Lord wants us to realize. Atmospheres attract spirits. Atmospheres attract spirits. Remember the people going up to those leading revivals and saying, I don't understand it. We seem to be in the service and the glory's falling. It's amazing and our family's doing great. But we get home. How many know there's spirits that are coming against that household? Come on. See, God wanted the children of Israel to experience success and not failure when they entered into the promised land. That's why God wanted them to get rid of what the people left behind. Come on. How many are understanding this? He wanted them to get rid of what the people left behind. You know, for some of us, people have left things behind in our lives. And the Lord wants to get rid of those things. They're not possessing you, but they're oppressing you. Never. You're filled with the Holy Spirit and they're clinging on. Yes. And we've got to let them know that this is the house of the Lord. Yes. Right? And I've had people get mad at me. We've got to get our theology in alignment with the Word of God. Yes. I mean, what did Jesus do to Peter? Get thee behind me. Yes. Just to discern the atmosphere. When you walk into your home and something doesn't feel right, you need to go to war. If you walk in this house and something doesn't feel right, we need to go to war. If I walk into work and into my department and something doesn't feel right, hey, it's time to go to war. How many hear this in the Lord? This is important. We've got to understand this. Pastor Cindy, can you give us a verse on the screen, please? John 6, 63. Yeah. John 6, 63. We need to understand this in the Lord. How do you know God's trying to teach us today? Yeah. This is teaching more than preaching. First comes the knowledge, then comes the test. 
Okay. I want you to notice what Jesus said. He says, the spirit gives life and the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and life. So the words that Jesus speaks are full of the spirit and life. That means the words that the devil speaks are full of demonic bondage and death. How do you know it goes both ways? Okay, I'm going to say this in love. For some of us, there's people in our lives that aren't speaking words that are spirit and life. And God may tell you in this year, I need you to distance yourself from them. Well, that's not the love of Jesus. The Lord understands atmospheres. And while you distance yourself, you're going to pray for that person. You're going to fast for that person. You're going to stand in the gap for that person. But for some of us, the Lord may be saying, you need to step away because this is affecting your atmosphere. When you're around negative Nelly all the time, and when you're done spending time with negative Nelly, you feel like you need to take a gallon of anointing oil and pour it out over your head. Who's affecting whom? Are you affecting negative Nelly or is negative Nelly affecting you? Come on now. And we've got to realize this, guys. The atmosphere that I'm talking about is spiritual, it's physical, it's invisible, and it's real. And sometimes we have to fight to keep the atmosphere clean. Yes. If it's your home, comes out of that television program, those words come into your house and manifest damnation in your house. If you're watching a show and F-bombs are going off, defiling spirits can come through those words. See, that wouldn't care that an actor spoke it. All he cares about is you're letting it in your home. And if you're letting it in your home, he's a legalist and he knows there's legal ground for him to come in. That's why we need to pray through our homes periodically. We need to watch the music we're, we're listening to, the programs we're watching on television. I'm sorry, but our television can be a portal to hell if we're not careful. Yes. Our television can also be a portal to the third heaven. Because that same TV that I can watch a Netflix show on, whether GD and MF and, and all this stuff, Pastor, I don't even like you using those initials. Well, you got to understand what God's trying to say. That same television being a portal letting that stuff in your home is also the same television that you can watch anointed teachings on. Yes. Amen. And play praise and worship through in a streaming channel. Mm -hmm. See, light or darkness can come forth from it. And the way you use it affects the atmosphere of your home. If you're watching television programs or movies where people are having affairs, guess what has a right to start manifesting in your house? Spirit of adultery. Is anybody catching this? Well, Pastor, I don't, I don't know if I like what you're saying. Well, it's reality. And it's very interesting. There's really two types of atmospheres. There's a sterile atmosphere and there's a fertile atmosphere. A sterile atmosphere is cold, unwelcoming, institutional, and unloving. How many have ever walked into a church before and felt a sterile atmosphere? Let's be honest. Absolutely we have. I can walk in this building and tell whether or not people are getting along. I haven't liked some things I've felt lately. We need to work on that. Because that will hinder the move of God in the building. If we are not loving each other the way we should. What's a fertile atmosphere? It's full of peace. It's welcoming. It's pregnant for the glory of God to come. <laughs> See, we want a fertile atmosphere in this house. When we love the Lord and love each other and love whoever God brings around the foyer... We've got a fertile atmosphere in the house. Yes. Come on. How many received that? Yes. So we've got to fight. We're not fighting people. We're fighting principalities, powers, and wickedness. Yes. That can get hard because sometimes principalities work through personalities. Yes. And that's where we've got to love. We've got to learn to love the person but hate the principality. Yes. When we hate the principality and we really don't like the person either, we've got a problem. Because that allows the enemy to come in the building. And sometimes I think we have to fight to get a breakthrough in praise and worship. But what we're fighting is our own attitudes and our own words. Pastor, I don't know if I like this message or not. Well, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
So third thing the Lord wants us to understand is this. Atmospheres must be sustained. This is important, guys. Atmospheres must be sustained. That's why a church can have a powerful church service on Sunday in total warfare in the prayer service a few days later. You know why? We haven't maintained the atmosphere. That's why after an amazing move on Sunday morning, before prayer on Friday evening, we need to pray through the building. Why? Because demons are drawn to the supernatural. When the glory falls, you're going to be amazed at what shows up. And not all of it is God. Turn on the porch light in the middle of the summer and what gets attracted to the light? The summer night. Right. So we've got to understand that. But we always need to love people but hate what God wants to deliver them from. How many received that in the Lord? Okay. So we've got to understand this. And, and please, I know I've been preaching for a little while, but don't tune out on me yet because this is, this is important. In every service, there's a moment when the Holy Spirit wants to move to shift the atmosphere in the room. We've got to lay hold of that moment. See, there's times in worship where all of a sudden we're starting to get a breakthrough and I can feel the shift of the Holy Spirit. The Lord wants us to move in that shift. At the same time, the enemy is looking for the smallest hole that he can squeeze through to do something to suck that move of the Holy Spirit right out of the room. And I've seen it happen before. So we're in praise and worship, and all of a sudden we're getting a breakthrough, and there's a shift in the Holy Ghost, and then someone does something that draws attention to themselves. And I felt the atmosphere in the room go, and go that fast. So we want to watch out when God is releasing the glory and things are happening. That's when we want to keep a good eye on our own flesh so that we won't do anything that will shift that atmosphere right out of the room. Okay? So we had a time once in this church where we had a drama that was going on, a play that we were doing, um, and there was a platform that came out from the altar that extended out, and we're in the service, and the glory of God falls during praise and worship, and God starts moving, and all of a sudden a lady jumps up and starts dancing on that platform. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit was grieved and the presence of God went right out of the room. Why did it happen? Because right in the middle of the shift of the Holy Spirit, this person did something that drew attention to themselves. And the Spirit of God was grieved and the Spirit of God moved out of the room. That's why when we come into a service, we come in as a body, we press in as a body, we go after the Lord as a body, and we want to make sure everything stays in place. How does that happen? Staying led by the Holy Spirit. Right? Nobody in the room purposely wants to do something that's going to cause the move to stop. But sometimes we've just got to get to that place where we want to be so careful with the precious presence of God that we don't want to do anything to hinder what God's doing in the room. How many know that's a learning process? There have been times in the service where God says go right and, and I didn't hear right and I went left and the presence of God went right out of the room. I went, oh. And I felt the grieving of the Holy Spirit. I thought, I don't ever want to do that again. Holy Spirit said to me, you will do it again because you're learning, but I'll still love you. <laughs> and I went, that's a bittersweet hallelujah. But thank you, Lord, because we're learning. Right? We're learning. And we don't want to be afraid to make a mistake. But we also don't want to let the flesh. Right? So we're learning together. We're getting this together. Wait till the room's full of people and the glory of God falls. We're learning together. How many receive that? Right? If we mess up, the Lord still loves us. We're going to love whoever messed up. We're going to keep coming. We're going to keep pursuing. We're going to keep going after God. We're going to keep learning. And as God brings people in, we're going to teach them what he's been teaching us. And we're going to stay in an atmosphere of love. Um, how many receive that in the Lord? Yeah. So thirdly, atmospheres need to be sustained. Uh, we've got to understand that. Atmospheres shift when we do things our way and not God's way. 
And we've got to understand when people come in, they bring an atmosphere with them. Anybody remember the, the Peanuts cartoons? Yeah. Anybody remember Linus? What followed Linus wherever he went? A blanket, a blanket and a dust, dust cloud. Okay, God's going to bring Linuses in the house. We don't want to look at them and go, we don't want your dust cloud in here. We want to welcome them in and say, we love you. Let us help you with that dust cloud. Because the Lord wants to take away the old stinky blanket and he wants to take away the dust cloud. And people will come in and things hover over them. We want to love them as they come in. How many receive that? Yes. And God's going to heal them and deliver them and the hovering's going to stop. And then they're going to help people that come in with things hovering because they're going to recognize what that's like. The Lord told me once, he said, Andrew, in every generation I had a Daniel, I had a Peter, I had a David, I had a Joshua, the Lord said, in the end times generation, I'm going to raise up an entire generation of Joshua's. And I'm going to use them to cleanse the land. And they'll be passionate about deliverance because they'll know how important it is to need to be delivered because they needed it in their own life. And many of them looked and looked and looked and looked for a place to be delivered and couldn't find it until they found it. And they'll be the most passionate ones to see people set free. See, we're called to be an Isaiah 61 house. Mm -hmm. Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news of the gospel of the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to set the captives free, to set, to give sight to the blind and open up prison doors for the prisoners. None of those folks are necessarily glamorous. But we've got to allow the Holy Spirit to give an anointing to see through the blanket and the dust cloud and to see the beauty that that person truly is. I get excited about this. We're learning how to do this as a body. It's a process. Can I hear an amen? People are not the enemy. The enemy is the enemy. Okay, We can't forget that. Now this is interesting. You know, I mentioned there's two types of glory. There's the Shekinah and there's the Kavod. I really believe in the Lord, and I'm telling you guys right now, this is a lot of study and listening to what Holy Spirit is saying. I have yet to see a glory cloud come in the room, but I will see a glory yes. cloud come yes. and dwell. Yes. Amen? Yes. But from everything I've read, the glory cloud comes in as the Shekinah and shifts the atmosphere in the room, and then the kavod falls. The heaviness of God falls. How many want to see that in the Lord? How many want an atmosphere in this house where that's happening all the time? Mm -hmm. yeah. Where people just drive by and the Holy Spirit grabs their steering wheels mm -hmm. and pulls them in the building. I had a good friend that went to Toronto when the revival was going on. had gone several times with her husband. She was an aunt by marriage. And she said to me, the moment you hit the Canadian border and headed towards Toronto, you could start feeling the presence of God. And she said, you get couple miles outside of Toronto and you can see in the city in the distance and you could see the glory coming down on that building. And she said the closer you got and you got in the parking lot and you could barely function any longer. But she said she saw the physical manifestation of the glory cloud. That's what I want over this house. So that people all around the region can see the glory coming down and be drawn to the glory. I don't want them to even know my name. Who's pastor here? Who cares? The glory's here. Really? Pastors are servants. Can I hear an amen? amen? So we need to understand that. So, does the glory leave when you get home? There's an atmosphere that needs to be shifted or purged. Can I hear an amen? amen? And what is the Lord saying to us? Atmospheres have to be purged, prepared, maintained, and sustained. Let me say that again. Atmospheres have to be purged, prepared, maintained, and sustained. How do we purge an atmosphere? We pray through a building, for example, right? Okay. How do we prepare an atmosphere? Pre-service prayer, walking through the building, praying, speaking the words of God. Can I hear an amen? How do we maintain it? We watch what we're saying with our mouths. We watch how we treat people. We be careful what we let in the building. You know, Holly and I, well, I should, let me say this right, Holly Gardens, um, I help supply what she needs to the garden. And sometimes we'll bring bags of dirt in that we brought from Menards or Walmart. 
we pray over those bags of dirt before we dump them on our property. You don't know where they came from. You don't know where those bags came from. Do you want to know part of the, the challenge with watching movies and letting movies into your house? Hollywood as we know it, 200 years before it was Hollywood, was a place of Druidic worship in the hills outside of Los Angeles. And you know what they called it? Holy Wood. And then they just changed the letter and made it Hollywood. And there's a lot of horror movies and other things where they literally pay witches and warlocks and wizards to come on the set and make sure what's happening is authentic and even to help create an atmosphere. Then you're a believer and you turn that on in your home and what do you think happens? See, this is what we have to realize. We're in a war. C.S. Lewis said over 200 years ago, he said, uh, actually it was over 100 years ago, he said, when is the church going to realize that the earth is not a playground, it's a battleground? Yeah. How do you look into the church in our generation? Isn't that interesting? You know, it's fascinating. If we took a look at Ephesians 4.26, and Pastor Cindy, can you, can you give that to us on the screen, please? Um, Ephesians 4.26. You know, it's interesting when we look at this. Paul just simply says to the church at Ephesus, um, in your anger, don't sin, and don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Married couples, don't you dare let your eyes fall asleep at night if you're angry with each other. Because it opens up the door for spirits of anger and discontent to come in your house and manifest. You are one of the greatest effectors of atmosphere wherever you go. That's why you don't want to let the sun go down on your wrath. Holly and I, I think, do a decent job on that one. One of us, before the other goes to sleep, gives an I'm sorry or I didn't mean to do that or whatever it is because we don't want to wake up in the morning in a bigger mess than what we went to sleep in because now demons have danced around the bed all night long and poked at us. Well, Pastor, are you saying that happens? Absolutely, I'm saying that happens. And it doesn't matter what fold you're in or who you are. The enemy's coming against you because he hates who you are, who you love, and what you represent. How do you receive that in the Lord? And we've got to understand these spirits will move around in your house. They'll try to camp in your house. They like a place to live. We don't want to provide a place for them to live. You know, it's quite interesting that when the angels show up in Sodom and Gomorrah, know my, how, know my heart as I say this, the angels show up in Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot brings them into his house and then the men of the city surround the house. Don't they? And they have some things in mind that do not honor the Lord. Okay? And so Lot goes out on the front porch and says, Brothers, come on. Don't do this terrible thing. And he persuades and persuades and persuades, but nobody's going to listen. And pretty soon there's such a demonic fervor amongst these men to get at these angels that are looking like men, right, that they start pressing against the door. That's in the Word, is it not? What does one of the angels do? Pushes the door open, grabs Lot, and pulls him in the house. You know why? Those angels understood atmosphere, and they didn't want them in the city in that house. Well, it was because what they had in mind. No. First the atmosphere shifts, then the things happen. You catch that? See, first the atmosphere shifts, and then the things happen that shouldn't. So the angels grab, grab Lot and pull him in and slam the door shut because they don't want that atmosphere in the house. Is anybody hearing this? Yes. By the way, though, just as atmospheres can be created in a home through negative things, atmospheres can be created in the home through doing the things that God wants you to do. Playing praise and worship, fasting, praying, speaking life in the house, being careful what you're watching on TV. Can I hear an amen? Okay. Fourth and final point that I want us to get is this. A sustained atmosphere over time turns into a climate. Now, elders in this house, everyone in this house, I want you to understand this principle because it's very important 
and it's very important for what's coming to this house. Please listen to this. A sustained atmosphere over time turns into a climate. A sustained climate over time turns into a culture. Okay, let me say that again. A sustained atmosphere over time turns into a climate. A sustained climate over time turns into a culture. Meaning God is preparing this house to have a culture that will welcome in any, anyone God's going to bring when the glory comes down. Amen. He's teaching us as a church right now that a sustained atmosphere becomes a climate and a sustained climate becomes a culture and the Lord wants us to have the refuge culture, the lifeboat culture in this house as the glory comes. You know how you sustain a culture? Prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting help sustain the culture. I think right now if the Lord gave us a report card, it would say in progress and still learning. Hallelujah. <laughs> Anybody hear what I'm saying? In progress, still learning, not yet what you will become. But we are learning as a church. And you know what, guys? I'm going to be real honest with this. Right now, God's done some pruning in the house. What we don't want to do is take a look at that pruning and start going, well, I think people are leaving because of this, this, and this. No, God's pruning. Let's not give the devil credit for things that God's doing. And I'm not talking about anyone who's not here today. What I'm talking about is just some pruning that I know that God's doing. God's pruning the house. See, the problem is when God's pruning the house and we say, well, people are leaving because of this, that, this, the other thing, we're sowing those seeds into the atmosphere. And we're taking something God is doing that is challenging but healthy for the body and we're giving the enemy ground to begin to move. And then all of a sudden somebody's saying that and then there's another conversation going on by the coffee pot where nobody else is thinking it but those words are in the atmosphere and all of a sudden someone says, well, I think people are leaving because of this, this, and this. I don't know where that came from. It came from the atmosphere. Is anybody catching this? It came from the atmosphere. I'm not picking on anybody. I'm picking on all of us. Because I've seen that happen where God does pruning in a church and people start talking and say it's because of this person or that person or this, that, and the other thing. And all of a sudden the church implodes. Because of words being spoken and suspicion and all of this, well, pastor must be in secret sin and this must be happening and that must be going on when God's just pruning the house so it can become more healthy. See, we've got to be careful who we're, we're partnering with with our words. Spoken through by the Holy Spirit. How many receive that in the Lord? Well, pastor, this is not an easy word. It's not, and God didn't let, allow me to release it until this Sunday. So let me say this again. A sustained atmosphere over time becomes a climate. A sustained climate becomes a culture. And you keep it in place through prayer and fasting. That's why this house becoming a house of prayer is so crucial. Because it's going to help sustain a Holy Spirit ordained glory revival culture. Report card in progress and becoming. How many received that in the Lord? So let me tell you guys, and I'm going to wrap up with this. God wants to shift the atmosphere in this church and make it a culture of his glory. And you know what the Lord told me? And I thought this was amazing. He said, Andrew, I'm going to raise up glory centers all over the earth. And so my next question, if you think like I do, was what's a glory center? <laughs> right? I'm going to raise up glory centers all over the earth. The Lord said, Andrew, it's like Toronto, where people could look from miles away and see the glory coming down. And they're drawn to that glory. And then the glory comes out and pours out. And it's continuously doing that. Do you know what the Lord said? If we will pursue that culture, where he is Lord over all and we give the Holy Spirit freedom and we're careful what we say and we pray and fast together and we're going forth in unity and in harmony, the Lord says he's going to raise up glory centers where the glory doesn't stop flowing until 
we're at the wedding feast of the Lamb and it's all over. Because you study revivals and they had a defined beginning and a defined ending. God says, I want to raise up end times glory centers where there's no ending to this thing. The glory just goes up with them to the wedding feast of the Lamb. That's what I want in this house. And God's purging and He's pruning to get us there. Don't you dare think God's bringing judgment. He's dealing with us on some things. But He's pruning so we can become more fruitful. John 15. How many are seeing that in the Lord? Yes. Now, I'm not saying folks that aren't here today is because they're being pruned. That's not what I'm saying. But God's doing some pruning. I'm a relational pastor. That's hard for me. It's a challenge. But the Lord says, Andrew, I want you to trust me. He says, I even love the branches that are being pruned. He says, trust me, Andrew. This is my house. Unless the Lord builds the house, they that build it labor in vain. Years ago as a pastor, I'd go chase everything that was being pruned and bring it back in the house. That was a disaster on my part. Because God prunes for a reason. And he loves the unpruned and the pruned parts. How many are catching that? Yeah. Please know my heart as I say that. And as a relational pastor, that's hard. It's hard. But God says, I'm going to raise up glory centers all over the earth. And if that wasn't exciting enough, he said, this is going to be one of his glory centers. And by the way, glory centers will birth other glory centers. Lord said, people are going to come into this house. They're going to walk into the glory. They're going to ask, how in the world does this work? We're just going to bring them in and show them what God does and how he does it. We're going to open up our treasuries and only Jesus is inside, unlike Hezekiah. And then God says, they're going to take some of that with them where, they are, where they're going back to and there's going to be a glory center birth there. It's like a wildfire in the top of a tree in California. And because it's in the top of the tree, it keeps shooting out. Right? Flames hitting other trees and setting them on fire. And the firemen know they got to lop the top off of that tree if they're going to get the fire out. But the Lord says nobody's going to lop the top out of the tree. The fire is going to keep reproducing. How many, how many receive that in the Lord? Final passage, you may still be in the book of Luke. I want you to notice something in the Lord here that's, that's very interesting. Luke chapter 10. Uh, in Luke chapter 10 and verse 1, the word says this. After this, the Lord appointed 72 elders. 72 prophets. 72 kingly priests. 72 mm, anointed men and women of God. And sent them two by two ahead of him in every place or every town where he was about to go. And he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. How many know that it's time? Amen. Go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals and don't greet anyone on the road. Notice verse 5. And when you enter a house, first say, peace be to this house. And if a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker is worthy or deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. Well, that's a word for the church. Don't move around from house to house. Notice verse 8. And when you enter a town and you're welcome to eat what is set before you, heal the sick. <laughs> heal the sick and all who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near. But notice this church, verse 10. But when you enter a town and you're not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet, we will wipe off against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. I tell you, it will be more, more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. And notice what he says, Woe to you, Chorazan. Woe to you, Bethsaida. 
for the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, you will be lifted up to the skies? No, you will go down to the depths. He who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me. But he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Isn't that interesting? The Lord said, when you go into a town and you go into a house, speak peace over that house. Does that peace return back to you? If it does, that's not the house that you're supposed to be in. Isn't that interesting? He says, speak peace over that house. If there's a man of peace there, then your peace, then the peace is going to stay. Yeah, atmospheres are interesting. A little over a year ago, we had a new HVAC system put in our home. One of the gentlemen installing the HVAC systems was a pastor. He was a guy like me. He pastored, he worked full time and pastored outside of work. He told Holly, after he came in the house and was installing and saw things about the Lord all over the house and walked past the secret place, he said, I knew you guys were believers. The moment I pulled on the property, I knew believers lived here. What did he feel? The atmosphere of the presence of God. What's the Lord saying to the 72 that he sent out? He's saying to them, discern the atmosphere of a home. Discern the atmosphere of a home. This is very important. And you know what he said? That village or town that has such an atmosphere of unbelief and rejection of me, even beat the dust off your sandals as you leave that place and don't take it with you because atmospheres can follow you. Residue, you have to be very, very careful. The Lord's anointing flows where there is peace and his glory falls when there's the right atmosphere, climate, and culture. Let me say it again. His anointing flows where there is peace and his glory falls where there's the right atmosphere, climate, and culture. So I want to encourage you, don't leave this message today thinking to yourself, man, Pastor just blasted us today. No, Holy Spirit was trying to teach us today how to create an atmosphere that's sustained and brings the glory of God. How to create a culture in the house that honors God. This is a, a learning message, a teaching message for all of us. How many receive that in the Lord? First comes the knowledge, then comes the test. Now we need to take that, take what we've learned today with us and put us put it into practice. Faith comes by hearing. and hearing by and we're not just to be hearers of the word, but we're to be doers also. So I want to encourage you, take this word today and hey, gimel, hey it. What is hey, gimel, hey? It is the Hebrew word for meditate. Meditate on this word and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. You may get home today and Holy Spirit may say to you, um, I want you to pray through your house. Remember what was released from the pulpit today? There's an atmosphere here that I want to shift. There's some things in this house that I want gone. And the reason why you come home and you always feel this is because this has taken up residence and I want it to go because I'm jealous to have all of your house. How many hear that? So in quick review, the Lord says, number one, he knows that atmospheres can affect us greatly. Number two, he knows that atmospheres attract spirits, right ones and wrong ones. The right atmosphere in this house opens up the doors for holy angels to come in the room. Amen? Number three, atmospheres must be sustained. And number four, a sustained atmosphere over time becomes a, cult, a climate, and a sustained climate over time becomes a culture. And you perpetuate that culture through prayer and fasting. So guys, I tell you, I'm really not interested in pastoring a church. I want to be part of the glory center. Amen. 
<laughs> because the church hasn't been what the church is supposed to be. And God says, I'm tearing down the old model of what church has been, and I am raising up glory centers all over the earth. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. How many receive that in the Lord? Anybody want to be a part of that? Amen. It's a choice. God is giving us a choice. We learned yesterday in prophetic group, love is a choice. Amen? The glory falling is a choice. And I tell you what, but for me in this house, we're going to serve the Lord. And we're going to become a glory center. And I want to invite everybody to be a part of that. Because everybody's needed. Even the toes and the ankles the wrists and the hands. <laughs> Every part of the body is needed for the glory center to come about. How many received this word today? Yeah. I've been excited about this word for weeks. The Lord finally says, okay, you can release this word. Hallelujah. So let's do this. Let's just bow our heads and close our eyes for a moment. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, I just ask right now that Lord, if there's any Corazon or Bethsaida in this house, Lord, remove it. Lord, if there's anything in this house that hinders what you want to do, Lord, remove it. Lord Jesus, if there's anything in this house that would cause green or red mildew on the walls, Lord, remove it. Because, Lord Jesus, we want this house to be a glory center for you. Lord, I ask that you will take this word that was released today. Lord, it was released in this room. It was released on the internet. It's going to be released via radio. Lord, may this word go into the timbers and the beams and the drywall and the cement and the, the metal that makes up this building and become a part of it, Lord. And Lord, may this word go into us, the houses that we are and become a part of us, Lord. Lord, we want a climate that becomes a culture, that becomes our DNA, and may that be the glory of the Lord. Lord, I pray that you'll help us take this word and apply it to our homes. Lord, if any of us need to go through our homes and pray through them, Lord, may you anoint that and bless that. And Lord, even as we pray through our homes, may negative words and things that have been caught in the wood and the timbers and the drywall and the shingles come out in the name of Jesus and go into the abyss. In fact, Lord Jesus, I ask for this house and all of our houses represented here and everyone listening, Lord, I ask that you would send angelic cleaning crews through those houses. Even while we sit here right now, even while you listen to the word in your car, Lord Jesus, may you send angelic cleaning crews through the houses. And Lord, may they begin sweeping them clean. And Lord, just as when I walk, well, just as when I walk in from work at night and Holly and Aaron, Hannah, whomever has been cleaning in the house, and I can smell cleanliness in the house. Lord, even as I walked in here the other day and I smelled a fragrance, folks had been cleaning the bathrooms and it just smelled terrific. Lord, may we walk into our homes and smell a fertile atmosphere of the glory of the Lord. May we walk into our homes and smell the roads of Sharon. May we walk into our homes and smell the lily of the valley. And Lord Jesus, I speak your peace and your shalom over our homes and over this house. In your precious name, Lord Jesus. Lord, we love you. And we thank you for this word. First comes the knowledge, then comes the test. Lord, help us, hey, gimel, hey. Help us meditate on this word and walk it out. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Did you enjoy the word today? Amen. Hallelujah. It's very practical, powerful word in the Lord. This word ties into what we're about to see. Let us now put it into practice. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, do this for me, if you will. Let's stand before the Lord. And uh, I'm going to ask Brother John, our resident Levite, hallelujah, to pray the blessing over us today.
And after we do that, hallelujah, have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. God bless you. I think there might be a group of us going to get something to eat afterwards if anyone, if anyone wants to join us. Hallelujah. But I just bless you in Jesus' name. Thank you for coming today. And most importantly, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, Father, thank you for being here today. Hallelujah. Everybody raise their hands and close their eyes and just meditate on the Lord. Yes. Receive a blessing from him. First will be in Hebrew. Second will be the interpretation. Yevarechecha Adonai v'ish marecha. Yair Adonai panavalecha v'chuneka. Yisa Adonai panavalecha v'yasemlecha. Shalom. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance toward you and fill you with peace. May he bless your ventures this week. May he bless your households. May he bless you with discernment to know what is of him and what is not. May he bless your finances. May he bless the work of your hands. May he add life to your years and years to your life. In Yeshua's name, amen. amen. Hallelujah.